Welcome to Lectures in the Law, a series designed for ordinary people to provide information on legal matters in plain language so that um, ordinary citizens will have a degree of legal sophistication as they navigate the muddy waters of uh, the legal system and to encourage you that the law can be a tool to help rather than an instrument to hurt. Our topic today is, uh, has to do with foreclosures and evictions. Uh, we are threatened with a tsunami of uh, cases in those areas. Uh, foreclosures are up 200% uh, since the moratoria have been lifted and rents are, are rising against the backdrop of this, <coughs> these uh, inflationary era, era prices, rents in the District of Columbia and we have rent control are up six and seven percent. And of course uh, the, the landlords and investors and homeowners are, are being uh, threatened as well because of uh, the, they didn't make any money during COVID. So we're, we're facing a landslide of cases where people may end up in the streets. And so I'm delighted to have with us today Attorney Edward Tradone, who, um, you know, my mother always told me, Eddie, we call him Eddie. He's our friend, that uh, nothing wrong with doing well so long as you do good. And Eddie is one of those lawyers who practices regularly in landlord and tenant court, and he's a fair and fair-minded lawyer, very few and far between. So he meets my mother's standard. He, uh, he's in landlord and tenant branch two or three days a week. He knows his way around. He works with the judges. He gives advice to the courts. I'm so delighted to have Eddie uh, as our first guest. And joining me as our first guest host is uh, Judge Alexander Williams. Judge Williams is a retired federal judge and has a storied history of service to the public. Uh, he was state's attorney in Prince George's County. He uh, was a law professor, Howard University. And, uh, of course, he served uh, for many years on the federal bench. You're in for a treat this morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And let me just give one disclaimer, a word of caution to our viewers before we start. The information that you will receive today reflects a general application of the law, usually in the District of Columbia and should not be relied upon for specific situations and legal matters outside of Washington, D.C., nor should it be used as a substitute for the advice and counsel of a lawyer. A lot of good lawyers out there, if you find yourself in legal jeopardy and exposure, get a good lawyer, don't count on us. These are good people here with me. They know what they're talking about, but uh, get a good lawyer if you find yourself exposed. I'm going to start by allowing Judge Alexander to say a few words and then we'll get right into our topic. Judge? Thank you, Johnny. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a very critical issue that we're looking at and uh, I thank you for that introduction. Of course, you missed the most important part of my uh, qualifications. And that is I'm a DC native. Right. Grew up and was reared and went to Theodore Roosevelt High School. I'm a rough rider, so uh, yes, that's always uh, something that's important to me. 
But uh, these are critical days. And of course, uh, evictions and foreclosures are on the rise. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from uh, Attorney Eddie today. And he's going to help us walk through these critical issues that we may have some comments from time to time. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. And let me say that I probably missed the most important thing you did. And, and when there was a void in leadership at your church, you stepped in and, and took charge and kept things in rain. Oh, yes. So um, we're going to let um, Eddie start. But let me just say finally that there's, there's this um, stigma that's sometimes attached to foreclosure and, and evictions and uh, people don't seek the help that they need because they're embarrassed that they're, they're going to lose their home or get put out of their home. Uh, I want to remind everybody that, uh, that Jesus was a homeless person. Joseph and Mary were homeless people. They were not derelicts and vagabonds. They, they just happened to be homeless and search for a place to stay. So there's nothing wrong if you find yourself in that situation and hopefully uh, we can give you some information to help you out. Eddie, you're on. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And I would like to thank Attorney Barnes for inviting me here to uh, participate in this presentation. Uh, I am a resident of Washington, D.C. I have been a practicing attorney for the past 22 years in the district. Uh, our law office is also located in the district. And uh, we mainly concentrate on real estate litigation uh, with a very high concentration in landlord tenant work and eviction work uh, which is a very high volume uh, type of work in the district as it is in most other big cities. Uh, in, in the district prior to COVID there was about 30,000 cases a year filed in the landlord tenant branch of DC Superior Court. 93 percent of those cases are rent cases um, at the, although it sounds like a lot of cases, on average only 5.5% of the people actually get evicted out of the 30,000 cases that are filed each year before COVID. Um, there, are, there are also evictions that are done that are not rent cases. The other 7% are made up of people who are breaching their lease, owners who want to move in. Uh, evictions that are related to drug raids by the police and also evictions related to foreclosed homeowners whose lending institution has foreclosed on them. Um, with regard to the evictions related to foreclosures and also all other evictions, the COVID crisis changed all of that in the district uh, more so than almost any other jurisdiction in the court. The District of Columbia imposed many restrictions uh, related to evictions, both with foreclosures and non-foreclosures. Uh, the general process now in the district is that if you're lending the for there was there were moratoriums in place on foreclosures for a certain period of time. There were also moratoriums on actual evictions, the actual filing of cases and the actual issuance of issuances of legal notices that had to be done before a case could be filed. So there were, for almost a year and a half, there were basically no eviction cases that could be filed of any kind in the district. All of those moratoriums have been lifted. However, based on many of the laws that were passed, most of those expired because they were emergency legislation that extended protections to tenants and homeowners as well. Uh, and some of those, some of the provisions in those pieces of legislation have lived on with what is now the permanent legislation that has many changes uh, as opposed to what the law looked like before COVID. With respect to if you are a homeowner facing foreclosure, the process in the district is as follows. Your lending institution will institute a foreclosure action against you if you are delinquent in paying your mortgage payments. Prior to COVID, the lending institutions would generally conduct what is called a power of sale foreclosure where they just send notice to the homeowner and they auction off the property at, uh, on the steps of the auction house. 
However, in most jurisdictions and now in the district, almost all lending institutions file through a mechanism called judicial foreclosure where the bank files a court case and the civil branch of the court conducts a case and issues a judgment if they find that the foreclosure was proper, this way eliminating any controversy as to whether the foreclosure process was proper or not, which used to happen regularly when these foreclosures were done by auction on the auction house steps. And so once your lending institution obtains a judgment, they then have the power to put the property up for auction. A bidder, the highest bidder, then becomes the equitable owner of the property. They pay a deposit of money and they get a memorandum of sale saying that they are the purchaser of the foreclosed property. Prior to COVID, that purchaser could go to court and institute an eviction action against whoever was in the house. That process involved issuing a notice called a notice to quit to be out of the property in 30 days. And if the occupant was not out of the property, then a court case would be filed. The procedure has changed. One of the new COVID laws requires that the purchaser at auction of a foreclosed property now has to actually go to settlement and be the legal owner of the property um, before they can institute any eviction actions. So now the bank, <clears throat> once they put the property up for auction, the winning bidder has to consummate the sale, go to closing and become the legal owner. Um, and then they can issue the notice and also file the court case. In the district, tenants of foreclosed properties have more protections than the actual foreclosed homeowner. There are laws in place in the district, most notably a case called Valentine. And this case says that if a, you are the tenant of a foreclosed homeowner, the new owner cannot evict you if you want to stay. They become your landlord. You, you remain on as the tenant, provided that you can provide proof of a tenancy in the form of a lease or canceled rent checks. And so if you are a tenant of a foreclosed property, you are afforded protections that the foreclosed homeowner does not have. And so there are protections in place in the district for tenants of foreclosed properties uh, who might be facing eviction. There are protections in place. I also encourage anybody, whether they're a homeowner or a tenant, the DC Superior Court has many resources uh, to provide free legal help from the DC bar, the landlord tenant uh, resource center, which is in the court, which helps small landlords and tenants answering questions staffed by attorneys from large law firms to assist people for free with any landlord tenant issues. There is also the Legal Aid Society of the district, Bread for the City, Neighborhood Legal Services, and also the DC bar, all of which provide legal advice to people uh, who are involved with landlord tenant issues in the district. With evictions that are not foreclosure related in the district, as I said earlier, there are 93% of the cases are rent cases. Most of the cases get resolved and only 5.5% of cases actually filed result in an actual eviction. Um, most landlords are willing to work out agreements with tenants and sign agreements to resolve the non-payment of rent case by entering into payment agreements that allow people to pay back the balance uh, over time with extra payments each month until the balance is paid. Prior to COVID, a landlord in the District of Columbia must have a legal reason to evict the tenant. There are only eight legal reasons. The number one reason, as I've indicated a couple of times, is non-payment of rent. In those rent cases, uh, prior to COVID, the landlord was able to file a court case as long as they had a lease, which uh, included a provision that they were not required to file any notice or serve the tenant any notice prior to filing a case. Some of the part of the COVID legislation that was passed by the DC City Council 
now requires a rent notice, a legal notice in English and in Spanish to be served on every tenant, regardless of what the lease states, prior to filing a case in D.C. Superior Court to evict somebody. Um, and again, many of those cases are resolved between the parties because it's beneficial to both the landlord and the tenant to reach some sort of an agreement to have the payments made over time rather than the tenant moving out and the landlord being stuck with both an empty unit and also no money for the past rent that's owed. During COVID, uh, there was an abundance of rental assistance that was made available to D.C. residents who were tenants and also landlords. This program in the district was called Stay D.C. This program was money from the federal government to all the jurisdictions in the country to pay back rents for tenants provided that certain documentation was filed. That program went a long way uh, in addition to the moratoriums that were in place, but that program went a long way to keep many, people's, many, many people housed and not subject to eviction. It made many small landlords whole because the money was paying the rent that they needed to pay both uh, mortgage payments, property taxes, utilities, insurance, uh, repairs, payroll, etc. Uh, prior to COVID, the DC, the Stay DC program closed last October 27th. However, the District of Columbia, both prior to COVID, during COVID, and post COVID, if that's where we are now, also has a rental assistance program called ERAP, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, this is a program that tenants can apply to if they're delinquent in rent. They are generally allowed to apply once every 12 months. And as it stands now, the guidelines um, allow rent to be paid for five months worth of market rent. But if the tenant owes more than that, uh, the program can put in for a waiver to assist the tenant with more in an effort to keep them housed. The landlord tenant court is still operating in a virtual fashion where cases are done online and not in person. One of the good things to come out of the COVID, come out the, to come out of COVID, and also the virtual court hearings, is that there are now rental assistance representatives in the courtroom online every day, who can give real-time updates on applications, and it makes the process much more efficient in getting the tenants' rent paid and getting the landlords their money. Uh, Again, everything I've just spoken about is for non-payment of rent cases, which again are over 90% of the cases uh, in eviction court in the district. The other cases are breach of lease cases where a landlord is suing a tenant to evict them because they are committing some sort of material breach of the lease. The lease says no pets, they have two dogs. The lease says only one person can be living in there and they have three or four. In those situations, the landlord is required to give the tenant a 30-day notice to correct or vacate. They have 30 days to either correct the violation or vacate the property. If at the end of the 30 days they have not done one or the other, the landlord then can go to step two and file a court case. Eddie, if I may jump in here, because I don't want to get too far from the 90% uh, of the cases that are in landlord and tenant court. And I like the stay DC and, and I like the ERAP and, and I think our government ought to do more of that because both sides win. Uh, the landlord or homeowner gets money and the tenant gets to keep their home, you know. Uh, and I'm gonna let, uh, let the judge jump in here in a minute. Um, my mother always told me that, uh, that if you have a roof over your head and your health, you can make it. Housing is about making it. And as you know, Eddie, I do a lot of uh, foreclosure defense and a lot of uh, uh, defense uh, against evictions. And it's just so heartbreaking to me uh, when someone in their family faces uh, the loss of their home. And, and, and we need to do more because housing is about making it and i would hope that more lawyers uh, would particularly black lawyers would get involved in defending these foreclosure cases i'm sometimes i think i'm the lone voice in the wilderness fighting 
for these uh, uh, foreclosed homeowners. And 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 tenants the same way. They they uh, ain't a whole lot of money in it, but you have an opportunity to let your life's work speak for you. Judge, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I certainly agree with that, uh, uh, Johnny. And I wanted to ask uh, a, a lawyer, George, uh, just uh, comment if he can comment on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, how does mediation work? Uh, I do a lot of mediating myself, and has it been effective? I know you said most of the cases are resolved, but uh, just tell us a little about mediation, and then I have another question. Prior to COVID, if a case was in landlord-tenant court and the tenant was contesting the case, they could request either a bench trial, which is a trial in front of a judge in landlord-tenant court, or a jury trial. Those cases were not handled by landlord-tenant court and they would be certified to the civil division to be assigned to a judge on a regular civil jury trial track. With jury trial cases, both parties have the right, you, you are required to go to mediation as part of the jury trial process. And, you, and the way that it worked with bench trial cases in landlord-tenant court prior to COVID is that they would make you speak with the mediator on the day of trial. Sometimes that worked, but one of the criticisms of that is that people were felt under pressure at 11 o'clock in the morning with a trial going forward in the afternoon to settle. So post-COVID, what the landlord-tenant branch has done, in all cases that are scheduled for bench trial, you are also now mandated to go to mediation. However, that mediation is held on a date prior to the trial date. That has worked out very well and has resulted in many settlement agreements and a lot less stressful of a mediation because the trial is not the same day. That's another benefit that the court, that has resulted in the court because of COVID. They structured it that way and it's working much better now. Most of the mediators that handle the landlord-tenant cases are very familiar with landlord-tenant law. Some are former landlord-tenant practitioners who used to litigate these cases on one side or another. And, but that has worked out. The mediation has worked out well post-COVID because of the different structure that they've established to have the mediations on a date prior to the trial date. I'm glad to hear that because I would encourage our listeners to look into that because mediation is always more effective than actually going forward because you, the risk of losing a case and getting thrown out is too, just too much of a challenge. The other question I had is this, uh, a number of states now are amending their constitution or drafting legislation that's giving those evicted a constitutional or statutory right to an attorney. Uh, does DC have that uh, or are we moving in that direction? Or what, what's happening in that area? Um, there is no right to an attorney in a civil case in the district. Um, there is a wealth of legal resources afforded to tenants who need representation provided that they qualify financially. Uh, there are five legal organizations that represent tenants pro bono. Uh, however, there is no right to an attorney in a landlord-tenant case currently in the district. Um, we find, just based on my 25 years of practice down there, that there is much more representation now than there used to be because the court now has in-court offices like the Resource Center, the Attorney of the Day Center, and when the speech is given in the morning to the litigants prior to the court cases being called, they are encouraged if they want to speak to an attorney, you can go upstairs and sign in. So. Unlike many other types of cases and many other types of court, when, when you, courts, when you walk into landlord-tenant court, within an hour of you walking in, you can be sitting in front of a lawyer helping you, assisting you with your case, which is not the case in all branches of the court in different jurisdictions. And, and that's so helpful to know that the, the city and the district is so receptive to making sure that resources are available for citizens in these type cases. I mentioned that the whole thing about constitutional right to an attorney is that I know in Maryland they just enacted legislation that absolutely requires an attorney to all persons who are being evicted. So D.C. may not need it because, again, they're, they're very pro-tenant uh, uh, and that sort of thing. The atmosphere seems to be uh, very receptive to tenants. 
There's a lot of programs that DC has established that don't exist in other jurisdictions sure. to help people, to provide them with legal representation. Right. Years ago, the Court of Appeals issued an administrative order. Uh, as everybody sitting here knows, if you were an attorney who entered your appearance in a case, you were in the case until the end unless the court allowed you to get out of the case. But the D.C. Court of Appeals years ago issued an administrative order that allowed, in an effort to provide more representation to people who were not represented in high volume courts, especially landlord-tenant court, allowed attorneys to enter temporary appearances for a limited time. It could be one court hearing, it could be a week, it could be a month. That way, tenants who are facing eviction, trying to stop an actual eviction that might be scheduled two days from now, didn't need to retain an attorney to come and appear. They could get a limited appearance by a pro bono attorney just for that court hearing. And those, those uh, could be renewed as far down the line as you needed, which again, uh, provided many more resources to tenants as far as legal representation goes. That, that limited appearance change in how the court operates allowed many more people to be represented at individual hearings in addition to entire cases. And you know, Eddie, that is so important, the ability of lawyers to do a limited appearance uh, to stave off an eviction maybe that's to, supposed to go on that day. Uh, and it, it's so very important, but if I may summarize some of the jewels that we've heard so far, um, Eddie has said that, uh, that don't be discouraged if you get an eviction notice or a, a, a summons to go to foreclosure court. You have rights and you have resources. So don't be discouraged. Learn your rights and, and search out those resources. And of course, the judge said something very, very important uh, that it took me years to really uh, get a good grasp on judge, and that is you roll the dice when you go to court. In fact, uh, old lawyer said the best lawyers never go to court. You know, you mediate, you work things out. Mediation allows you to control the outcome and not some individual who comes in and hears both sides in, in a few minutes and then decides your fate. Mediation is a good resource and there are excellent mediators uh, all around uh, the DMV and as the judge indicated, he's, he's one of them. Um, you control the outcome with mediation. So you have rights and resources, and you have the opportunity for mediation. And you can avoid uh, the expense, the cost, the losses that one suffers with, uh, with litigation. So I, I, was, uh, I was glad to hear those points. I could not agree with you more. I remember when I started practice, there was two, two litigants in the courtroom in front of Judge Michael Rankin. Neither one of them wanted to go to mediation because there was a lot of animosity between the landlord and the tenant. And he made them go to mediation and he said, if you go to mediation, both of you control the outcome of the case. If, if you don't mediate and you don't settle and you come in front of a stranger like me in a black robe, I'm gonna make a decision and somebody is gonna be very happy and very likely both people may be very unhappy. So it's, it's in your best interest to go try to speak with a court mediator who's a neutral party. And uh, I can say from my experience in court over the years, having mediations with bench trials on the same day, that I tried many times to get cases settled and we couldn't get it settled, but when we did appear on the mediation date with a neutral party, that matter got settled. So I found useful the foreclosure court because it does encourage mediation and working things out before you get into litigation. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Eddie? Yes, with, with the non-judicial foreclosures in the district back in 2014 and prior, the bank generally just had a mail notice of a foreclosure to a foreclosed homeowner. There wasn't even requ a requirement that the person actually, pr that the bank actually proved that the homeowner received the notice. And then the auction would happen and oftentimes people didn't get notices. There was a typo, they didn't get the mail and issues like that arose. And then there would be a whole wealth of wrongful foreclosure litigation in the civil court and everything would be a mess for all parties involved. 
With the judicial foreclosure, the bank has to file an actual court case, which allows a court to oversee the process of, by which the foreclosure is taking place. It also requires notice to the other side to appear, served like you would serve any other court case, not just by mail. And the most important part, as Johnny indicated, is that it allows the court to have the parties mediate, which is now a requirement before the bank can get a judgment and have people sit down and try to get these matters resolved under the umbrella of a court hearing with a judge presiding over it, as opposed to somebody trying to call a 1-800 number at a bank to try to talk to a loan officer about their foreclosure. And an auction is happening on some auction house steps uh, in which the only notice provided would have been in DC anyway, which would have been a notice by mail only, not personal service of any hearing or anything like that, uh, which is why almost all the lending institutions now opt for judicial foreclosure. Yeah. It closes all the loopholes, it prevents a lot of unnecessary litigation later, uh, and it's overseen by a court, and it's usually more, it works more efficiently when it's done that way than it does outside of court. And let me mention one other thing, and then I want the judge to tell us a little bit more about mediation and how that works. But um, the, uh, you know, when uh, we had the first round of, uh, of uh, foreclosures uh, and uh, the banks, a lot of the um, homes were under water, and so the banks were happy to get rid of them any way they could. Um, and then all of a sudden the real estate market blossomed and bloomed and the banks wanted to hold on to those properties. Now we're, we're getting back to a time because we're trying to fight inflation and the, Res the Federal Reserve Board is pushing these high interest rates and everything that a lot of these homes, again, the real estate market is, is stagnant. So, um, Mediation again becomes a tool where everybody can, nobody will win, so to speak, but everybody can control their destinies. Judge, if somebody wants, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., we have mandatory mediation in the courts. Uh, it just, you got to go through mediation. But if somebody wants a private mediator, such as yourself, how do they find them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And mediation is the way to go. And I wanted the listeners to certainly uh, understand that you don't lose anything by getting a case mediated. And the reason for that is that mediators are very balanced. They're independent. They're not rooting for either side, but they just want to help facilitate a resolution of the case. Uh, there's a number of private mediation companies around as a number of lawyers and judges who are part of that and all you have to do is simply look uh, for or do some research and find a mediation company and ask for an assigned judge uh, but again or it's or the attorney but mediators are uh, in my opinion they're just like the judges uh, I, I found in superior court I've had a few cases in my earlier days of practice in landlord and tenant court, I found the judges to be knowledgeable, they were fair, they were trying to resolve the cases, they were not bent on one side, but they just wanted to see that both sides got their day, and that's what mediators do, and uh, I've been mediating now for about seven years now, and uh, have uh, resolved. How can people reach you if they want you as a Well, mediator? I'm with the uh, McCammon group, uh, McCammon. Uh, uh, and I've uh, mediated in Virginia, and in DC and in Maryland. So you just call the McCammon Group or look in the uh, phone book or, or, or look it up, or they don't use phone books anymore, just right. go online, <laughs> you know, and look at it. And they're out of Richmond, but there's a number of lawyers and uh, judges, retired judges in the Superior Court, and myself. Uh, uh, I'm a retired judge in Maryland, but I do mediations in both. Uh, D.C., Maryland, as well as Virginia. Also. Yeah, you did that big case uh, in Baltimore. Yeah, I did. The, uh, I was a mediator. I was a mediator for the Freddie Gray case. Freddie Gray case. As you all remember the uh, big uh, civil case that involved uh, a civil case uh, by the family of Freddie Gray versus the city and the police department. And I was able to get involved and bring both sides together, and we settled that case for uh, about uh, $6.5 million. Mm -hmm. I just completed, uh, I don't know, Eddie, if you remember Judge Shuker. She's a. Yep.
mediator and I just did a case, a uh, mediated case with her, big case, and and um, the insurance company was on the other side and, and she whipped us all into shape. And what, what could have taken three, four more years is, is now at least uh, to some satisfaction of each side resolved. And just tell the citizens should understand, the listeners, just don't be afraid of mediation. And again, what you say in these proceedings cannot be used in court. It's just a confidential kind of thing, and uh, you're just trying to resolve it. So if you uh, concede certain points, it's not going to hurt you if you end up back in court. And again, the idea is to get a resolution that you can live with. And that sometimes the risk of going to trial uh, can be devastating. And so, as, as Johnny uh, Bond said, you control your own fate in mediations. And that's the beauty of that process. So mediation is the way to go. But let me get back to, if you, if you find that, you're, that litigation is the only option, just hope you get a, a guy like Eddie Cardone, uh, Cardone uh, on the other side, because he's a, that's why we call him Eddie. That's why we like him. He's, he's fair, he's reasonable. And not every, not many um, bank lawyer or landlord lawyer or investor lawyer uh, can work with uh, uh, tenant lawyers uh, the way Eddie does. I've always found him to be fair and reasonable. I can talk to him. And when he gives me, when he, what he says is his word and it's good and it works. Um, he's with the law firm of Blumenthal. Cordon and uh, Blumenthal, Cordon and Urklauer. Urklauer. And uh, so you represent tenants too, don't you? You yes. will. So he's not just a landlord lawyer. Right. Yes. And one statement off topic a little bit that I wanted to make earlier, but which I didn't, which is very DC specific. The population of the district increases by about a thousand people a month. One of the reasons that there's housing issues in the district with the cost of buying and or renting and the prices are very high is that DC has one thing that no other major city has and that is a height restriction. No buildings can be built over 130 feet high. So the development is always moving out because it can't move up. There's very little buildable space left in the district. So the supply is somewhat fixed although the demand is increasing every month, which is why the prices continue to rise in the district because of the limited amount of build. They cannot go up, you, it, unlike New York or Chicago, you can't add 30 stories to an existing building because you can't build more than 130 feet high, that, which is why the price of housing in the district has been high for quite some time and continues to survive the banking crisis years ago, COVID as well, and during COVID, there were uh, houses were selling in a week still, which is hard to believe in the general sense. But when you understand that there's a height restriction and the, uh, the supply is fixed and the demand is increasing and the federal government is located here, that's one of the reasons why rents and housing prices are astronomical in the district and not in other major cities. Well, it's interesting. I've had some, some experience with that. And, and it's a very practical reason uh, it's to maintain the uh, the federal vista. Uh, you know, there are some routes the, the airplanes will take coming in, and it's a beautiful sight when you when you pass by all those mm -hmm. iconic monuments that we have in Washington D.C. So they don't want anything uh, overshadowing, uh, you know, the the Capitol, the White House, the the Washington Monument, and that's why there's a height restriction. There was a um, a developer, Gestepi uh, Checky, who built the Renaissance Hotel down there on 9th Street. And he, he had a lot of influence, a lot of power, and he wanted to, to build that building higher than, uh, than the restricted level. And um, he came to understand who really runs Washington, D.C. <laughs> when he, when he sought to do that. Back in the 1930s, on the, right off the corner of Q Street and 17th Street Northwest is an old building called the Cairo. And that's the tallest building in DC. It's 160 feet high. And it was upon completion of the building of that, of the Cairo in the 30s that they passed the law of the height restriction yes. to cap it at 130 feet. Yes. 
Well, this has been a good session uh, for me. I've learned something. I hope you've learned something. Uh, Judge, any closing remarks you want to make? No, uh, again, uh, this has just been exciting just to hear it. I've learned a lot myself, and I want to hope that the listeners here will, will certainly be a little more knowledgeable of the process associated with foreclosures and evictions. Uh, again, uh, we hope it doesn't become astronomical, but at some point uh, we have to know our rights. Thank you. Any closing remarks, Eddie? Yes, I just encourage anybody in the district who receives some sort of eviction paperwork or eviction action uh, between the time of the first notice that gets sent to you, 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 it will be at least six months before you go to court and maybe longer before any final resolution, but I encourage everybody to act and pick up the phone and either call an, a, the landlord the landlord's attorney, a pro bono attorney from the court, as early on in the process as possible because that communication oftentimes is an integral part in getting the matter resolved. Many times, even before you go to court on the first day, don't wait to come to court to start looking for solutions. Start looking for solutions months before you get there as soon as you get informed of the first uh, legal action being initiated. And you know, um, that pearl of wisdom to which uh, my mother uh, provided me uh, has it just stayed with me since I was a very, very young boy, that if you have your health and a roof over your head, you can make it. You can make it. Housing is about making it. And then I read this book, if I may judge, and Eddie, um, early on in my education called The Good Earth by Pearl Buck. And uh, for me, it was a housing story because uh, the main character in the book was a guy by the name of Wang Lung. And he was a poor farmer in China and he became very rich uh, by accumulating land. And whenever he faced trials and tribulations as we all do, he would go out and look over his land, and he would say to himself, still there's the land, there's always the land. You have rights, you have responsibilities, of course, but you also have resources, and I'm speaking to you, our listening audience, um, use them. And if you need a good lawyer and you're facing eviction, call Eddie. If you need a good mediator, and you're trying to work things out with the bank or the investor or the landlord, look up Judge Williams. He's, he's among the best. Uh, there are ways out. I always say to people that Jesus was homeless. He was not a derelict or a vagabond. He was homeless. And so there's nothing wrong if, if you come upon hard times and you face foreclosure or you face eviction, then look for help. There is help in Washington, D.C. and other places. And I want to thank our, my, my guest host, uh, Judge Alexander Williams, who has been a, a, a servant for many, many years and a private practitioner. And I want to thank my good friend, uh, Attorney Edward Cardone, I call him Eddie, uh, for being the balanced kind of practitioner that we really need in our courts. And I want to thank you for listening to us and tune in next time uh, for our next uh, series. This is Lectures in the Law. I'm Johnny Barnes, your host. Thank you.